Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Anthony Cazenza with the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast and CincyJungle.com. I hope you are doing well. I'll be joined shortly by my, my co-host, uh, John Sheeran. So uh, hopefully we will we'll be joined by him. And um, if you have some comments or questions that you'd like answered, please leave them in the comment box there. And we will attempt to... Uh, get to as many questions and comments that we can. So appreciate you tuning in today. We're going to um, talk about some things, do some uh, question, questions and answer, as I said. Um, so uh, I believe I've got Aaron joining us here in just a second. So uh, he just requested. So we're going we're gonna to bring him in. But um, busy weekend ahead for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, uh, you know, obviously a... A lot going on. John, how are you, bud? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Uh, I'm doing all right. We're just kind of getting started, and uh, thanks for thanks for coming on here. I, you know, uh, we, we tried this out last time, and um, our first time kind of going at it here, and uh, we're, we're going to try and answer some questions. But uh, hopefully, you you got on here okay, and everything's everything's going well. Some interesting news coming around. Uh, so kind of trickling in so far, right? Yeah, I'm just bummed, man. I we almost we almost made it through the preseason without <coughs> a um, season-ending injury, but it sucks what happened. Yeah, so, here, so I took the air last night, uh, shortly after the game, and I I didn't make any promises, but um, it it at the time it seemed like it was not a. Um, was not a season ending injury, but um, it has since been confirmed that Rodney Anderson uh, has torn the same right ACL uh, that he tore in college, unfortunately. And um, really a shame because he looked so great in his debut. And uh, one week later, it's, it's all, it's all done. So he's probably going to be on IR. Hopefully this doesn't sidetrack him or, or derail his entire career, but uh, interesting Interesting news, sad news going there. Uh, we're going to, again, if you've got uh, some questions, leave them in the comment section here. Um, we've got some others that have already come our way, so we'll get to those. Kind of starting off on a little bit of a lighter note, John. Um, we had a, a question from, um, from a listener and a reader, uh, I, unfortunately his name's escaping me at the, at the moment, but he emailed us in kind of asking, you know, why and how some of these wide receivers are able to have single digit numbers. He's mostly talking about Damian Willis and all of that. Just kind of an interesting little tidbit piece of information. Um, you know, obviously as the final roster happens, they go into the teens or obviously the 80s. But uh, I don't know if you want to shed any more light on that. Um, just kind of how and why guys are have have those odd jersey numbers, especially this time of year. Well, receivers can only be ten to nineteen and right. eighty to eighty nine in the regular season. But obviously, when you have ninety players, you're, those those number groups are getting are going to be full, and um, the single digit grouping is typically has a lot of space because it's just quarterbacks and, and specialists. So. Uh, in the college game, you can have single-digit numbers for running backs and wide receivers, and a lot of those guys uh, in college have had those numbers. So I think that's just where they place them, just because you just have too many you have too many players and not enough uh, numbers to fit the regulations. That is what the NFL. Enforces. Yeah, and you know, obviously, as guys make the um, as guys make the roster, and you know, do some. The, kind of move forward in the regular season if they've had one of those numbers that is ineligible um you know they obviously make a switch so damian willis number nine is probably going to be damian willis a different number coming up here uh next week as we... yeah 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 do you have I'd a say guess? probably 15 you have a guess? but i i don't know what about you maybe yeah i i, I don't i don't remember what he was in college um he can't be 19 so that's odd and take um someone's gotta be 13 i think that 13 is like the top Receiver number. I would love if yeah. Boyd changed to thirteen. So you have Ross at eleven, Boyd thirteen, Green eight. Yeah, I think yeah, that was cool. from Dave, David Morris, um, <laughs> who basically just kind of said, you know, he he knew that the the rule about the teens and the eighties, but uh, you know, he thought it was interesting that 
Um, some of those guys are wearing different numbers. Moving on, we received a few text messages recently. And by the way, we've, we've got some more in the comments we'll get to in just, uh, just a second. Um, let's see. It was... <laughs> The someone about uh, someone texted us about fantasy football. Unfortunately, Scott Schultz isn't here, but it was about the number one pick in the league. Um, it, should Saquon Barkley be, be his number one pick? Um, God, I I number one overall in fantasy. I quit this year for a reason. Yeah, uh, it's hard to go wrong with that. I guess. Um, like I guess the only guy you could really challenge is Alvin Kamara. They're both guys. They'll get a lot of a lot of touches in in the receiving game and in the running game. I guess it depends on if you play PPR. But that Giants offense, man, like it's going to be living and dying by Saquon. And I think the offensive line is is better than it was last year, so he should have an easier time of, of gaining yards uh, before the line of scrimmage. But like they're going to run him run him into the ground. That that team believes in just pounding the ball and getting the ball out of. Eli Manning and Daniel Jones' hands, whoever starts at quarterback. So, yeah, probably Okay, let's move on here. Zachary Stemple in the live chat says, uh, who takes Anderson's spot on the 53? Why don't you go first on that one? I want to see what you say. Well, all of a sudden, that once deep group is – I mean, we were just talking about how deep that group is. Rodney Anderson's probably on IR. Travion Williams has a foot injury. He'll probably be all right, but may not be back week one. Um, you know, so all of a sudden that gets a, a little dicey. I mean, I think Flowers has, has done some nice things. I, I, I kind of like the Ellis kid, um, at least as a temporary solution. He kind of just did all the dirty work. He did a lot. He caught out of the backfield in the preseason. Not really anything super flashy, but, you know, maybe some, someone that uh, they can lean on for a week or two in a reserve role. Um, I think, you know, once again, some of these guys, maybe once other guys get healthy, he would be a, a first guy off of the final roster. But maybe that's a guy I'm looking at. Yeah, I think, if I had to guess, I think they roll with just three running backs until they need to sign another one. Because I think Williams is supposed to play against Seattle, and they're probably only going to activate three running backs anyways. They're going to probably keep one of Ellis or Flowers on the practice squad that they have four that they can they can use at any time but I think in terms of replacing Anderson on the roster it might come on the defense I think they might go 24 on offense just because the the defense is where the majority of your talent is and whether that's going 11 defensive linemen and maybe looking to move one of those guys or probably like six linebackers like like Anderson's injury might have opened the door for a free agent linebacker to sign with the team and there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to have conversations I know people are already asking about Brandon Marshall He's not really good. But, yeah, like, I think six linebackers might be more of a possibility now that they're going to go light at running back, unfortunately. So some news hit that's not really Bengals-related, but um, in a way I suppose it is. Uh, the Oakland Raiders, soon to be the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, released linebacker Brandon Marshall today. Um, a little bit of a surprise. He was a guy that was released earlier in the offseason, right before the onset of free agency to um, you know, makes to do some things there, but uh, you know he didn't really latch on in, in Oakland. A lot of people are asking if you think the Bengals should go after him um, right now. Do we just talk about this? Uh, no, like yeah, yeah. Um, he's not good, and um, the Bengals had interest in March, and if you can't make it as a linebacker with the Raiders, then. He's probably not much better than what the Bengals have right now at linebacker. Obviously, he's a, he's a name and he's a, he's a veteran and he has success in the past, but the the, the dude's washed. And like, it, there's a reason why the Bengals didn't sign him back in March. He didn't sign for very much in Oakland. And again, if if, if you're not going to make it on that defense, the, you just there's just no point in just looking at looking at him now. They should go with other names. That did you did you mention available. him already? I. Uh... Yeah 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 yeah. He, he was a, he was a possibility of a guy that they could sign. To replace Rodney Anderson, but I would. I apologize. I'm sort. I'm trying to multitask a bit now. Uh, uh, I thought I said that. I but. apologize <laughs> if, if you if I made you repeat yourself. But a lot of people are asking about that. Um, 
John Branch asked about Andrew Brown. Um, what do you think your his chances are on making making the squad here? I, he's done everything in his power to keep a spot here. Now, obviously, the defense line for the Bengals is, is harder to make it than the other defensive lines because it is the strength of the team. But I don't know, man. It, it was it was Tupo who was out there first with with Ronald Wren uh, last night. They went a lot of like playing Billings and either Tupo or Wren. So they just had no they just had no intention of rushing the passer last night. But Brown, I think, had a half sack, had a tackle for loss, and he's just he's just he's, he's just playing really well. And it's just hard to cut a guy like that. But I would still think he's the eleventh guy right now. And I think they still only go ten. But if there's one guy on the on on defense who I'm pretty sure they're going to want on the practice squad is definitely him. He's on my 53, but not the one that I'm, that I'm And what about Malik Jefferson? Uh, Steve, Steve Purdue in the, uh, in the Facebook <laughs> chat. Uh, have you ever heard of a non-football illness? Like, like, what was so wait, he, he didn't play last night because right. of a non-football illness. What is a football uh, illness? I could tell you. Like, I, it, it, he didn't play last night, and he made the same impact as the first preseason games. Like the the guys just, it's just not there. And maybe maybe they pick him up in the practice squad, but if they don't, then yeah, there's just no harm moving yeah. on from a guy like that. I mean, aside he's from wasting a third round pick, that's that's kind of the biggest shame of it. But um, yeah, I mean, just never it has not materialized. I mean, granted, he's still very young, and it is his second season, but uh, just has not materialized. We got a text, John, I believe it was from Dan in Tennessee. We got a text uh, a little while ago, earlier this week, um, kind of talking about the New England Patriots and their their trades for offensive linemen. They surprisingly made another one, as we sit here on Friday, for, for believe it or not, <laughs> Russell Bodine. So, um, I don't know, man. Uh, I, I this Dan texted us saying, you know, this is why they're successful. They make moves. They do. They continue to tinker with the roster. They're rarely ever fully satisfied with the roster. I mean, your your thoughts on that, especially when we look at the Bengals' offensive line, the linebacker group, and here we are, a cut down day, no trades made as of yet. Uh, you know, they still could get some guys on waiver wire, but um, I mean, are you kind of disappointed that really not? Any big, any relatively splashing moves like what the Patriots have done? Granted, it's for Bodine. Um, are, are you a little disappointed? Are you surprised? Do you think something's coming? Uh, I think something may still be coming, either on the the offensive line or with linebackers. But if you had told me back in 2017 that on the same day Russell Bodine <laughs> would be traded to the Patriots and Kristen Western would be cut. I would have probably slapped you in the face. Sometimes the future is just is, is just shocking and it sucks. But good for Bodine, man. I guess like if, if the greatest offensive line coach of, of our lifetime, Dante Scar Scar usually wants wants to somehow develop Russell Bodine to anything more than what he is. I mean, there's just no better place for him to go in terms of elevating his talent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's shocking. And I hope Westerman um, at least finds peace with with what he wants to do. If he wants to still play football, I hope he finds another another chance to really grow. Hopefully, it doesn't turn into another. Evan Mathis type situation, but uh, definitely either an offensive lineman or a linebacker would be where you would look in terms of if they're going to end up making a move, if they're going to move one of those guys, or if they're going to trade maybe a draft pick. But I still don't think it's extremely likely, and I, and I wouldn't really count on so, it. So just just to catch everybody up, he's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. We're with CincyJungle.com and the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. Thanks for joining us on this Friday afternoon. We're trying to kick your Labor Day weekend off right. Hopefully, John's getting ready. He's uh, he's a little closer to the weekend time-wise than I am, so hopefully he's getting ready to kick it off right. But um, just for those of you who are just joining us, maybe you've been at work or something and haven't caught up with some of the news, a first wave of cuts has been made. Linebacker Curtis Aikens, center Kirk Barron, safety Demetrius Cox, long snapper, and uh, special teams MVP last night, Dan Godzel. Uh, cornerback Tony Lippett, one of their guys they went after uh, in the offseason that they kind of felt was was a somewhat high-profile guy, didn't make it. Uh, defensive tackle Dare Odeyingbo. Uh, Christian Ringo was waived with an injury settlement. Linebacker Sterling Sheffield, defensive end Emmanuel Turner. 
Uh, kick, kicker Tristan Vizcaino, who had a rough night last night. And then, of course, as John mentioned, Christian Westerman. That's kind of the first wave of cuts as we sit here on Friday afternoon. They will be finalized uh, pretty soon here. And I will be taking the air later this weekend on Sunday afternoon to talk about not only the final roster, but also the waiver wire additions as, as that deadline is on Sunday. So, um, you know, the Bengals may be making some moves there, and uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I thought this was interesting, an interesting comment here. Kevin Riley, Gio, is Geo off the trading block now that Anderson has a torn ACL? I don't think he was ever really on the trading block, personally. That rumor kind of just wow. started somewhere out there in the Twitter, Twitter sphere, and um, I don't know, but I don't think he was ever on the trading block. Do you? Yeah, me, yeah, me neither. Um, I, I think it started because his agent, I don't know if it was Rosen House or not, uh, was in town for a weekend, and that was when, um, like, he didn't play or he didn't practice because he, he first got injured and we didn't really know anything about it. So Trayvon Williams took, took his reps in a training camp practice, and then he didn't play, I guess, for a preseason. And, yeah, so, no, de- definitely, definitely not now. Because Anderson's hurt, but I don't think he was ever. All right, so we block. got a call caller on the line. Uh, who's this? <laughs> Terrell, what's going on, man? Good to hear from you, buddy. Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, Zach Taylor is uh, is I just see like the edge that he's coming. He's bringing to the team, though. Just best player on the field was just it is not rising more than the. Uh, the past for Marvin Lewis. But uh, I got to just tell you that uh, no matter what, next year, all three positions, I'm just going to hit you with, we got to draft uh, three linebackers. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and at least a quarterback in the, in the, uh, the top 10 or top 15. Uh, what else? I mean, quarterback, they probably need some offensive linemen help as well. Linebacker, I mean, you're 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 stacking up the grocery list, my friend. Yeah, I mean, we, we know it ain't we not done yet, we not finished, but I just wanted to see him with more talent and more of his players, and you know what I mean, There's more of his personnel. And I just wanted to leave with uh, this guy just doing a great job, just with updating us and everything. And um, you know, I just I just hope that we we have a good year though, and uh, have a good day. All right, appreciate it, Terrell. Um, you know, he kind of, he didn't ask the question, but, um, you know, it's something that is kind of tying into, I saw someone else here, Adam Scott, what's your guys' record predictions for us this season? Will uh, Jason Hughes, will we get to the playoffs with Ryan Finley or Andy Dalton? Um, and then, of course, you know, you've got Terrell there on the line saying, asking us, well, not really asking us, but talking about, hey, I want to see this team really with more Zach Taylor personnel, Zach Taylor guys on the roster. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, to me, you look at you look at Rodney Anderson getting hurt today. You know, he's on IR probably. Jonah Williams. He's. It's been a rough go of it. I think if Zach Taylor gets his team to be pretty competitive, he's got to be in the running for you know competitive being maybe seven, eight wins and sniffing a wild card at, at late in the season. I, I would think that, you know, he's got to be in the running for a coach of the year, given what is given what he's had to endure and the low expectations for this team. Yeah. And it kind of rivals, I guess, 2011 yeah. where it, most people were projecting them, what, like two or three wins. They somehow go off with nine wins and yeah, like, the best case, I would say, is probably around nine wins. I think seven or eight is probably where the expectations are if everybody may, remains relatively healthy, which is, again, a dangerous assumption to make. But drafting three linebackers, man, you can draft as many as you want. If you're not going to sign anyone worthwhile in free agency and you still continue to stink at drafting on linebackers, it's nothing, nothing's really going to change with that. But that's another thing. Like if, if Taylor manages to continue establishing this culture that he has and, it's, and you know makes the team more attractive for outside free agents, they might have a better job of doing so, but signing guys, signing guys like Preston Brown to three-year deals when they're not, just, you know, signing guys who are just not relatively good athletes and not really changing your process in terms of drafting linebackers, nothing's really going to change in that department. So, like, you, every single year you can go down the list of, of what they need to draft, and it just stays the same because you don't, don't really do anything in free agency. So, yeah, like, I would love to see Taylor bring in more of his guys, but also want to see him establish different ways of bringing in So I've talent. got... Uh... 
I've got a question here, and it kind of it was a text message. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the person's name. I don't think. Oh, it's uh, it was from a guy who goes by Captain Camerica. So I think he goes by his name's Cam. Um, basically, he was kind of talking. He he had sent a text uh, about you know a trade for Jadavian Clowney and the um, you know the possibility of the team. Parting with Ross now. Obviously, this this was sent a little bit ago. Um, I mean, still very recently, but uh, obviously now he's expected. The news has since come out that he's expected to have kind of a role on a, a decent role against Seattle. I don't know, man. What 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 do you think the expectation level or the I don't know what 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 should we think about Ross in 2019? I mean, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words into what to ask, just because he's been, had such a frustrating career. He just he just has to stay healthy, and if he plays 12, 16 full games when he's 100, percent I think anywhere between 400 and 700 yards, a handful of touchdowns is, is nothing short of unreasonable. There's nothing short of reasonable in that sense. Um, I think the plan is for him to be that third or fourth option in the passing game behind. Boyd behind Green once he comes back and behind either Tyler Eifert or maybe Joe Mixon in a passing game. But like with the talent around him, the expectations for him to carry the load is is very minimal in that sense. But he just has to he has to he just has to still be out there. He just has to maintain his health. And there's no like there's no way we can possibly expect him to produce any type of high quality season if we don't see it first. Yeah, he just has to stay healthy and I don't think trading him now is the best way to do that because like it was back in February when these rumors first came out, his his trade value was very low and it hasn't really risen up anything because it's sudden played. So we can have these conversations next year if things turn out better and if he's still not tr- exactly the fit that they're looking for. But this is a, just a wait and see process for him to see how well he acclimates in this offense and if he can even prove his worth by staying healthy. I think that's yeah, two things um, that need to happen. Lawrence Hunter talks throws out the name Kiko Alonso as another possible outside help. Yeah, I, no, yeah, screw uh, that guy. I, yeah, I, I don't want. Him. I mean, maybe if if the price is absolutely right, but um, you know, I, I think there there are other options that make more sense, and he's pretty expensive, I think, too. Um, if if I remember, he's on a pretty expensive deal. So, um, right, we're going to get out of here in just a minute. Just uh, to recap, the Bengals have made a first wave of cuts. Um, Christian Westerman is among that first wave. Some others are, are pretty predictable. Tristan Vizcaino and others are in that first wave of cuts as we sit here on Friday afternoon. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. We hope that you have been enjoying this little bit of a different version of a Q&A. Usually we do these either via YouTube, live, Google Hangouts, um, or I'm by myself. So it's always nice to it's always nice to have a partner in crime here, but we're doing it through Facebook. And for those who listen to our Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast, This audio and video will be available through our channels soon, so check that out. We'll also be bringing you more updates throughout the weekend as well um, in terms of uh, other roster cuts, possible waiver additions, maybe trades. Who knows? We'll see. A couple more questions, and we will get out of here. Um, I like this one from Elijah thoughts on the tight end group and the factor and, and factor in how they will contribute. Um, a lot of talent there. I think um, it's a matter of health. It's a matter of if this offense is going to be tight end heavy under Zach Taylor in terms of, of contributions, at least for me, I think they'll probably have Eifert on a pitch count and will be, he'll be a red zone guy just because they got to, they got to keep him healthy. And uh, I don't, I don't think he's going to be out there all the time. He was very limited in preseason. I could be wrong, though, John, if you disagree. Yeah, um, just expect obviously pretty much all four of those guys to be active, and I say four, assuming right. either Mason Shrek or Stephen Carter is going to be used on special teams. Um, sample, you have him when you're in your bunch formations, when you're in 12 and 13 personnel, when you have multiple tight ends on the field. When they're in 11 personnel, when they have just one tight end on the field, ex- expect a, a rotation between Uzoma and Eifert. And as far as how those guys are used, I think they're going to try to use both those guys pretty similarly. And we saw that uh, last week against the Giants when Uzoma had that had that tight end screen and had right. that wheel route for the touchdown. Those are plays that you want to you want to involve Eifert in as well. And obviously they were reserving Eifert in meaningless preseason games and trying to get Uzoma more acclimated in these creative plays. But yeah, I think 
the plan is obviously to go heavy in 11 personnel and only have one tight end on the field. But also, you know, this is what Taylor told uh, me and a couple of the reporters when I was down there a couple weeks ago. Uh, 11 personnel is very fluid, and so is 12 personnel, and it really depends on the usage of, of tight ends. So you can have, you know, what it looks to be just a regular three wide receiver set, but you can also have two tight ends on the field. So there could be 12 personnel spread out a little bit more because you have versatility with athletes like Eifert and Uzoma. So I think, obviously, they're not going to want to overuse Eifert if they don't have to, if Uzoma can do the same things in, in a similar way. But obviously, you want to maximize what you have with Eifert when you can. And that's in, you know, in the red zone, crucial third downs late in the game. You know, basically ride Uzoma as like a starting pitcher. Use maybe Eifert as a relief pitcher in, in, in certain uh, specific scenarios on the field. But I think there's a lot of talent there as long as Eifert maintains health. And if he goes down, then they might have to get creative with, with how they use sample and might have to use him more in, in ways that you would maybe want him to wait. As he yeah, uh, Andrew Seiler, uh, good to see him joining us again. He says he likes the Facebook setup. But we he did ask about Brandon Marshall. We talked about Brandon Marshall, and we talked about him twice, actually. So... Uh, <laughs> again, my apologies on that, John. Um, but uh, Andrew, you'll have to go back. We're not we're not going to talk about Brandon Marshall a third time. Sorry, buddy. Um, some talks and questions about Jeff Driscoll. I mean, I think you and I both agree that he's probably gone. Um, he is gone, basically, uh, unless something unexpected happens, yeah. or Zach Taylor thinks they can get some sort of odd unique role i keep i keep throwing out the name Taysom hill with the saints uh i i just don't see it though um personally so um one last one what about ross as kick returner i've seen a couple people ask that um he he did it well in college when he was given the opportunity but given the fragility um you know i don't know i don't know if you want to sacrifice potentially sacrifice him there i never really liked the argument of you know, if a guy's good at something and you're worried about getting him injured, I don't know. I, I don't really like the don't do don't let him do something he's good at because you're worried he's going to get injured. But there are exceptions to every rule, I guess. And and Ross is a guy who's always hurt. Um, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing him get an occasional chance at it, um, especially if he's not really having an impact as as much as we would hope on offense. But your thoughts? I think. His value is higher on punt returns because that's the area where you want to see improvement. Because I think Erickson, Alex Erickson, Darius Phillips are fine as your main kickoff returners, and just the value of a kickoff return now is a lot lower than it was a couple of years ago when they moved kickoffs up to the 35. So you might only get maybe a handful of opportunities to actually run it back. Which, in that sense, you would want a guy like Ross who can run a 4-3 on demand. But I think if you want to use him in as a as returner. You would rather him as a punt return because that's where Erickson isn't as good in regards in comparison to kickoff returns, and that's where there's, there's, they were still looking for guys in training camp who can do that. So maybe one or two punt returns, kind of very similar to I think what they did with Adam Jones. Like if the when the defense had like a short series, they um they they, they kept Brandon Taylor on the bench and they used Adam Jones because he because he could provide a spark. So maybe that's kind of what they do with with John Ross. I know it's not the same because you're you're involving two receivers instead of a receiver and a quarterback, but I like both Darius Phillips and Alex Erickson's kickoff returners, and if you want to provide a spark in the punt return, maybe use Ross there one or two times. But, I mean, being fast is just the first part of the equation of being a good returner. You still have to have vision. You still have to have patience. You still have to catch the ball back there. So if he's good at it, you know, I wouldn't mind it a couple times a game, but it's not something that I would necessarily yeah, prioritize. Yeah, um, you know? we've gone a little long, so we're going to get out of here. But there is one statement this poor guy's said something i think two or three times about this player and because he used capital letters and three exclamation points on his last comment about this player we'll we'll indulge mark graves um talking about jake dolagala give a, at least a quick statement of him and his performances this preseason i i thought the game three was awesome he was 10 of 12 94 yards two touchdowns yeah um a little bit more – some weaknesses were a little bit more exposed last uh, on, on in the last preseason game. But there are times where he uh, – for a guy who's as big as he is, he avoided pressure. He rolled out, made some nice throws. Um, unfortunately, some guys dropped a couple of throws that were – they were tough catches to make, but they were catchable. I think Josh Malone had one across the middle he should have had, a um, couple of others. So um, – Overall, I think I think he exceeded my expectations. We knew about the arm strength, but um, we didn't know if he'd just be winging the ball around and nobody would be able to catch it, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So, um, played pretty well. 
to be honest with you, and I want to get your your feelings on this too, John. To be honest with you, in terms of how I would feel if he made the team or if he if they cut him, um, I see I see positives and negatives in both. Um, you know, I, I think if if he's staying on the fifty three, um, you know, you better be dang sure that the rest of the those weak areas of the roster are shored up with with some talent and and the the right amount of depth. Um, especially if you're gonna if you're gonna keep around a developmental guy, I think we always say this time of year, this guy's never gonna make it through waivers. And what do they do? They make it through waivers, and lo and behold, they're on the practice squad. Quarterbacks are different. Um, we we know that. So, um, you know, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really be heartbroken either way. Um, and I'd I'd like to see him develop into a you know a potential backup down the road. But we'll see. Your thoughts, John. Yeah, I think you should try to keep as many good quarterbacks as possible. And I think Dolagal's skill set is worth keeping around, at the very least at the practice squad. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't think he's going to be a popular name yeah. for other teams to pick up because, uh, like, it's, like at the end of the day, he was still an undrafted guy right. from a D2 school. And while he has played well, it's not been so outstanding that everybody is lining up to sign this guy. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. But if you do want to go three quarterbacks, I think Dolagala is a guy that you should definitely for invest in the future and, and see what, kind of where it goes in the next couple of years. You know, he's obviously not going to challenge Finley as the backup because Finley's the fourth round pick and he's played decently well himself. But to answer um, uh, Zachary's question a while back, who takes Anderson's spot at fifty three? That honestly could be the guy. They got three quarterbacks and three running backs instead of loading up at another position that they're already deep in. So if, either way, I think I think it's a smart strategy to either keep him on the fifty three. Or try to resign on the practice squad because he's he's got a skill set that is, it, that is worth I, keeping I around. I completely agree with that sentiment for sure. Uh, good stuff, everybody. Yeah. Appreciate all the questions. We got a we got we got a call. We got text. We got all the comments in here. Uh, I unfortunately only have two hands, so I wasn't able to really check Twitter and all of that. So if you did tweet us, I apologize, but we'll try and get to some of those. Thanks for tuning in here. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend. Be safe. Uh, keep it to CincyJungle.com for all the news, opinions, analysis, breakdowns, and uh, we'll have probably a lot of breaking news this weekend coming up here as the Bengals whittle down their roster to get to the final number. John, thanks, thanks, man. This has been uh, a little bit fun. It's been a little different, but pretty fun. We'll we'll have to make, maybe make this a. I have I have not used Facebook this much since like <laughs> middle school, so I'm really yeah. Run I don't uh, I don't use it very frequently myself. Primarily, actually, through the Cincy Jungle account. So, um, but we appreciate everybody uh, tuning in, and if you get a chance, check out our podcast. If you haven't yet, it's on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, basically anywhere you get a podcast. And it's also on YouTube. We have some fun. John and I are the main contributors there. And um, we've had some recent interviews with Bengals players, coaches, all that good stuff. So check it out. Thanks, everybody. See you, John.